go live. So now we went live. It says we went live, but you know, right. I don't, but you know, I don't believe that. So now <laughs> I do is I go to my profile. Do you know I'm live twice now? I'm also live on YouTube. Did you know that? So now what I do is I go to my profile, right? So I've got actually two computers because I'm getting all tech savvy now. So now what I do is I go to my profile and now once I'm at my profile, I scroll down and I double check, right? Because I don't trust technology. I know <laughs> that we're going to do this for like an hour and a half and then uh, I'll find out it didn't happen. And I see people are joining us. I see the right. coordination is here. So thank you so much for joining us. But I still don't believe it because you could be in on this. So now <laughs> what I do is I go here, right? And I double check because I have to refresh. So I'm still here. So now I go here and we did it. I can confirm we are live. Now what I do is I, is I turn down my music. And now we're live and it's just you and me and so many other people. So uh, thank you. I see that uh, DR Rec is here. So let me put that up there. And uh, DJ, excuse me, thank DJ you. Rec. DJ Rec, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And what a nice uh, summary picture that is. And uh, it is um, snowing outside today. So uh, I just walked in the snow. I got my M&Ms as I always do as my ritual for these things. And uh, I appreciate seeing the water. So that's very thoughtful of you. So thank you very much. And uh, I see also Janan is here. So, uh, so thank you very much. This is very exciting for me. And uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us. I'm so appreciative. And uh, the person I'm most appreciative, uh, appreciative of right now, for right now, is Tracy. So Tracy, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me again. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for making yourself available again. And um, would you be kind enough to uh, remind those people who were with us last time uh, who you are and a little bit of your biography? And um, then would you also, uh, and that's also true for, uh, for everybody else who knows your bio and for those who don't, and uh, we'll take it from there. And I really want to pick up from where we left off and we have a new president and they, uh, they've they got some new policies and we'll be discussing that. Okay. Um, yeah. So really my background is um, I started at the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, I worked as a broker at, at a boiler room. <laughs> I started and kind of worked my way up, worked on the floor. Um, then went out on my own for a while. I was Then I worked at a family office for a while. Um, and then now currently, um, since we've talked, um, I have a new position as the energy and materials uh, analyst at Hedge Fund Telemetry, um, where we uh, serve retail and institutional clients. Um, so everybody can check out the website. I give, um, you know, my, every week is material and materials and energy, as well as um, trade ideas and whatnot. And and you've been awesome. And uh, there's so much to pick up from, from where we last uh, left off. So maybe what I'll do is I'll do a reminder. Would that be cool? Okay. Well, it's a reminder. It's kind of exciting, and I wanted to surprise you with it also. Oh, no. Okay. I know. It's fun, right? <laughs> Look, what are the signals that we should be looking for uh, that energy prices have turned around? And when they do turn around, what are the companies we should be looking at that are doing the mergers and acquisitions and that you feel are best positioned to kind of capitalize on that turnaround? They're, they've learned to run more efficiently. They're operating more efficiently. They've got better assets to exploit and everything else. Right. So if we're looking at um, if they, we're looking at the United States, you know, I personally, I like Devon Energy, maybe something to put on your watch list, DVN. Um, I also like um, Parsley Energy, which I know some people will disagree, but I it's it's a company that I really like. Now I'm going to go back to that. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Those were definitely on my watch list at the time. So, 
They were, and they were like the leading indicators that uh, that you gave us because we weren't just really particularly interested only in the stocks, right? Uh, but we were asking, there were a lot of questions then about what are the leading indicators for both kind of an economic recovery and its durability. And uh, when that happens, how will we be able to observe it other than in our own energy prices and our own inflation prices? And then how can we kind of participate in that rally? So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, well, obviously, um, you know, energy has done very well since then. <laughs> um, and um, I think, you know, um, it, what's interesting, I find, is we were talking about Namibia. Remember, I was talking about nobody was talking about that uh, particular new find. Everybody was still on Guyana and, and whatnot. Um, and actually, um, suddenly, six months later, what is it, six months later, seven months later, people are starting to catch on and it's actually started to be in the news. So we kind of talked about that way before it happened. Um, and even we were talking about reconnaissance energy actually is up 613%. That was one of my recommendations back then. It's up 613% since then. Um, however, they are the first to start drilling there. So um, I would still pay close attention to that area because should they find something, you know, I believe that there's still room for that stock to go up or that company to gain, uh, to gain value. Yeah. And uh, we had a lot of questions then about crude oil. I watched the whole thing probably like three times now. And uh, I watched it maybe even four times because I was looking for the clip about Devon Energy. And uh, I was looking for the clip about Parsley. And then uh, having rewatched the whole thing, um, I see that crude oil was such a good leading indicator of uh, what's happening. And also you had a lot of questions about how much is energy prices a leading indicator of the health of trade? Right. Right. And since then, I mean, what we have seen is that um, definitely within, you know, everybody was worried about this jet fuel issue, right? Because still it's very lagging, right? Where it's, nobody's still flying. However, what we did see is we saw an increase in shipping globally, uh, maritime and um, cargo um, and trucking. So all of those picked up within uh, within the, the industry that kind of picked up some of that slack on the jet fuel. And that's also keeping a sort of a floor under energy prices because everybody's ordering stuff again and ordering all over all of the world. People aren't going out as much. People are ordering online a little bit more. And so um, that actually has been able to kind of pick up the slack in the jet fuel, demar jet fuel market. And what do you see uh, going forward now that I think your thoughts were we were going to see it later into 2021 and uh, it's really accelerated, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely accelerated. And, um, you know, I still think that we're due, I mean, if we're staying on oil right now, um, I do still think that, you know, further on down the line, looking into the future, down to 2022, 23, we're still looking at an energy crisis, right? I think we're still going to have a supply crisis, even though I think maybe perhaps prices have gotten a little too far ahead of themselves at this point. Um, you know, I, I'm still a I'm still a buyer on dips because I really think with um, the lack of capex in this industry, I mean, for demand to keep up or for for oil to keep up with demand from 2020, 2020 to 2045 is going to require 380 billion dollars a year in, in new investment. That's 12.6 trillion dollars till you know uh, 20. 45. And we don't have that in the pipeline, right? So um, yeah, I still think we're, we're headed into sort of an energy crisis um, in, you know, a couple of years out. Wow. Wow. And so how does the energy crisis start kind of expressing itself beyond just kind of inflation uh, in the cost of foods? Uh, and in the cost of, I think you were discussing how much uh, oil and 
uh, is used for our own kind of products, right? That we that I wouldn't have expected that it was so much a part of even our own hygiene products and our own kind of daily use beyond just turning on the air conditioner. Right. And that's why I always kind of said, you know, um, energy transition is great. And I actually I talked I spoke with Valina about this um, uh, on her podcast um, about the energy transition going forward. But um, what people don't realize is that it's going to take a lot longer than you anticipate. Right. So we want to make this energy transition. But what we are finding out now, if we look at, you know, what what's happened in California, what's happened in Germany, what's happened um, in Texas recently, that it's very hard to integrate renewables um, and uh, fossil fuels in the same grid system. Um, without really starting over, right? We're just building on top of, it's kind of like if you're building, a, if you're a coder, right? You're building a program and you just put old new code over old code over and you start getting glitches in the program. That's exactly what's kind of happening in these grid systems that, that we've been seeing, uh, again, California for a while now, a couple of years, but definitely over the summer. Uh, Europe had problems this fall. Texas is having problems right now. Um, so it's not going to be as fast and easy as people think. And that comes down to we're, we're still gonna have demand. And demand is not only in exactly turning on your air conditioning per se or your heater or whatnot, but it's literally in pretty much every product that you use every day. Um, you know, I mean, think your phone, your, um, you know, anything, literally think about anything that you use probably uses some sort of fossil fuel to make, you know, whether it's, you know, chemically oriented, um, any kind of plastic, um, and there's, the list goes on and on. I think I actually posted a list, list before. Yeah, you did. And so, and I, because I see everything that you do and uh, <laughs> you see it in volume and I do also. So I've got to make sure I scroll into, uh, into what I missed. And so uh, we have a comment here and thank you Avatan so much for joining us. And uh, you used to have a picture there. So what happened to your picture? Um, maybe I'm missing it, right? Is what um, the California you discussed the last time. And if you just want to kind of remind everybody about what was happening in California and then what's happening in Texas. And it's a two parter, right? It's a, that's actually a three parter question <laughs> is, is does, um, kind of the the lack of infrastructure also bode well as a leading indicator for the number of jobs and the slowness of kind of a green new deal or what's your thoughts on on uh, how to kind of uh, integrate the old and the new right I mean to actually integrate the old and the new uh, I mean literally we're gonna have to start from the ground up and that's gonna cost a lot of money and that's a huge infrastructure plan now you know, the reason that I think that it's going to be slower than most is because states can't afford to do it on themselves by themselves. And literally, Texas is the only one that's got its own grid system right uh, away from uh, the rest of the country. Um, but so you don't have state money and you don't have federal money right now to, to, to take on these projects. And that's just why it's going to take. Uh, why it's going to be s slower, right? Texas is kind of a different problem. What their problem was is they just had a systemic failure, right? They have coal, natural gas, oil, uh, wind, and solar, right? And they just literally had a systemic failure where all of them failed. So I know there was a big thing on Twitter and there were, you know, renewables people against the oil and gas people and the oil and gas people against the renewables people. But really what it came down to was just a systemic failure and on all parts of of the grid system. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're not winterized. But again, these kind of things happened. The last time this happened in Texas was 1956, right? So you're talking once every maybe 50, 70 years or so. So in the future, will they go ahead and pr probably make preparations uh, to winterize a little bit? Um, pro you know, probably we will see that happen. And if that incident happens again, Hopefully we won't see those those sort of failures. Um, but again, we're going to have to build from the ground up if you really want to do it right. And is that state by state? So, well, uh, Texas has its own. So they're away because they didn't want to be under federal uh, regulations. So they have their own. So the rest is kind of up to the federal government. And so when you do your own analysis, 
does any analysis for your clients, um, does that mean that in your own uh, kind of assumptions going forward, that you expect Texas to be more productive or less productive? Or what's your own analysis about what you're going to see coming out of, of Texas and their own needs? I think that, I mean, Texas is a very proactive state, right? So I think, you know, I mean, besides the fact that they're a big oil and gas state, right? They also have one of the largest wind farms in all of the country. And so they're pretty, have a well-balanced uh, energy infrastructure. It just needs to uh, be updated and, um, you know, tweaked a little, <laughs> tweaked a little bit. So I definitely think that they will be proactive in the future after this um, cause for alarm um, to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I have every faith that Texas will kind of go back and uh, remedy this situation or do the best that they can to remedy this situation. And I'm very interested because part of that Twitter battle, and there's so many questions here, so I really want to get to some of the questions and you're probably seeing them, right? Out of the corner of your eye, you're seeing them. <laughs> and there's some good questions here. But so when you look at this thing, do you see it as, and I hate to pick on Texas, but it, it, it was part of that kind of social media combat zone. Right. It, do you see it as a political failure or was this something that within your industry, everyone just said, this is going to happen? Um, no, I think it was, I think it was really unexpected. I mean, I think it was just, again, it's just a systemic failure. It was a f failure on every level possible, you know, whether, um, how the power was distributed within their, their grid system, um, and, and things like that. So I don't think, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that this particular instance could be avoided, but again, I think they'll do something in the future so that this particular uh, instance won't happen again. And does this happen state by state? Is this something that now is more, it becomes kind of this rolling blackout that we saw in California? No, I mean, I don't think, I, I mean, we've had, there have been blackouts in other states associated right in the Midwest on things like that. And we see random blackouts uh, during severe weather all over the country, right, within uh, different states. Um, and they just go in and patch it up. Again, that's under federal ju jurisdiction, though. So if you really want to do this right, you're going to literally have to start the grid system from ground zero, which, again, takes a lot of money and a lot of time. And that's why I don't think that fossil fuels are going to go away as fast as people might want them to. And in your own analysis, I'm just so curious about this. And there's a lot of questions. And one of the questions actually br brought it up, but I missed the question. So uh, I missed putting it on the screen. Is um, in your own kind of analysis, do you look at uh, the effects of that infrastructure in terms of employment, in terms of what's going to be built up within that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's um, one of the arguments for the Green Deal is it's going to bring about all these jobs. But you have to consider at what cost, right? So we canceled the Keystone Pipeline, right? Uh, this administration canceled the Keystone Pipeline, which cost to build the pipeline and sort of the businesses that would uh, support uh, that, you know, that was 11,000 jobs. So, you know, we're going to have to, it's going to have to be a give and take. But certainly if we have infrastructure deals, um, yes, employment would be, you know, major, major consideration as well as peripheral businesses that service um, those jobs. And I saw, and I think it was Anas, uh, and I have so much respect for both of you guys. Um, and... I, I saw in your what in your discussions on Twitter and actually off of Twitter with tele, telemetry also your the consequences of the pipeline is actually more pollution and higher expense right um, it is it's uh, it's more pollution and higher expense um, you know you have to tr train by rail it's expensive it's also extremely dangerous um, so you know. I, I mean, I think there needs to be more education about pipelines. It's, you know, it's fast and efficient um, and less dangerous. I mean, I think I've posted stuff on uh, how many uh, oil and gas train problems or train wrecks that, that we've had. Um, and you would be shocked how many happen over the year compared to how many pipeline problems that happen. Um, 
there was some uh, speculation from people I know who are experts in physical security, right? Just as you know, we've discussed, I've discussed in other uh, Periscopes and investor series about what's happening in special economic zones in Pakistan and their vulnerability to disruption, to deliberate disruption by competing factions, competing economic factions. Is there also speculation within uh, the uh, cargo and the, um, the transport that uh, the trains are being deliberately disrupted as part of kind of this political economic battle? I don't, I, I've seen some sort of speculation to that, but I'm, I don't subscribe to that view, not within North America anyway. Um, certainly that happens definitely, um, you know, you'll see that across emerging markets, particularly in uh, Africa, particularly in Nigeria. Um, so, I mean, that is a occurrence that does happen a lot, um, but generally not in North America, except for Mexico. <laughs> Mexico has had quite a few problems. And is that a uh, competing oil and economic interest or is that kind of an extortion from, you know, the gangs that are out there? Cause I yeah. know that is their thing. It's more of a extortion gang related issue. And in your, and then there's so many questions here. I'm just so curious. And so much of this as you know, and as a lot of people know, so thank you everyone for joining us is our kind of investor series is lunch, right? It's that type of, uh, if you and I, you're in Montreal now, right? But uh, if you weren't, if you were here or I was there because my son lives there, uh, we, this is a conversation that we'd be having over lunch because everybody kind of misses those days. So now it's a chance for us to have that uh, without without the uh, without the food, I guess. I mean, I'm not eating food. Um, and with so many people joining us, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a fun thing. So actually, I'm going to skip on to some of the questions because okay. it was so interesting. And uh, Janan Glasgow, again, thank you so much for being here, uh, says patent innovation always leads economic recovery. Patent filings are up 20% uh, overall, but in energy, uh, patent filings are down. It, it, yes, exactly. And that's why um, uh, that's why I think we're going to have a, a crisis on our hands, uh, because there's really, you know, overall, there's a lot of overall inter innovation. You see hydrogen, um, you see, you know, you're starting to see more nuclear, uh, which I kind of wanted to touch up, uh, touch on a couple of things that um, like I, I, oil trade was kind of like what we talked about last time. Um, and I think there's some exciting things going on in like, I've kind of moved on, <laughs> um, but we should definitely touch on like nuclear and um, and natural gas, because I think those are gonna be uh, big things moving on into uh, 2022, 23, 24. And there's a lot of questions here about that, but we're not <laughs> there yet because I'm kind okay. of rolling down and there's such fascinating questions. So I promise we're going to get there about nuclear. Um, so here, Patricia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, says Germany, and this is something I'm a little bit familiar with because in my own family office, we've looked at what a catastrophe economically Germany has been. Um, not just in energy, which is considerable because of the way they kind of uh, changed up allocations and, and cost. Um, and taxes and how they pushed it down to uh, the middle class, right? So it became this extraordinary additional tax. But um, so we looked at that as how it's also affecting their local industries, their auto industry and all the industries that are you know reliant on this and how it affects their consumers. Germany is a catastrophe. Can, so can you comment on that and what's causing that catastrophe? There's a part two, which is Nordstrom, right? The Nordstrom pipeline. Can you discuss what that is? Because I don't even know what that is. And the third part, the third part so like, yeah, <laughs> is how do we avoid that here? And how does the rest of the developing world avoid uh, the catastrophe we're seeing in Germany? Right. So, well, Germany, as you know, I mean, they're the big leaders of the Green New Deal in Europe, right? Um, that's their big push. I think some of the mistakes that they made in 2011 after Fukushima, right, they decided to close down all of their nuclear plants you know, systematically, they're, they, they're closing them down. So they're taking that out of their energy mix. And I think, you know, and that's, that that's causing a lot of problems. Now, now they also have, you know, they just did add a new coal plant this summer, just add 
just like to throw that in the mix, um, even though it, it had been planned before. Uh, but their energy mix is a disaster for them right now. Um, and the, the cost is being transferred to the consumer in the way of, uh, in the way of carbon, uh, carbon taxes, right? So that's affecting all of their industries, not only to um, you know, their citizens that are paying their electric bills, um, but also all the industries that use, uh, you know, use electricity. I mean, European uh, European carbon futures are skyrocketing right right now um, because it's you know it's going to be so become so expensive. And how is that something that America can avoid? And uh, also, how is that something the rest of the developing world that can least afford it, um, and they don't have the industry? to uh, pass on those cost increases. So they're kind of absorbed almost as a Pigovian tax by the middle class, which is the high consumer. Right. Um, well, it's hard. I mean, if you look at, I mean, look at Canada, for example, right? They just increased their carbon tax huge, like tenfold, um, you know, which is, you know, gonna hurt the farmers. It's gonna hurt pretty much every, the miners, every industry. Um, we, you know, we had every industry kind of here come out and, uh, you know, was very vocal against against the tax because it was so exorbitant. Um, so you are seeing that happen now. You know, again, this is this is the cost of these green new deals, right? Um, and they're expensive projects, um, and they're being integrated into systems into the, you know, electric grid systems um, on top of old infrastructure. Um, so we're gonna have problems. Again, it just boils down to, we're gonna have, we're gonna have, you're gonna see this in the developing world if you try to push this initiative too fast. And so I recall, and again, this is part of back, this is part of my own analysis within our, within our uh, research team. And back when I had a business in Germany, I recall that, um, we were looking for old, uh, in additional investments within within Germany. We were brought on by the EU, EU uh, you know, their own private equity, uh, you know, establishment because they wanted to bring on American dollars because of our laws would you know apply and everything else. So back then, around two thousand four, two thousand five, it was their um, uh, FEM, their Federal uh, Environment minister, uh, who I don't recall at that time, I think I met with them, maybe it was Trenton at that time, said that uh, the cost was going to be about, the the cost for the energy transition was going to be about a euro per month. And uh, now that's kind of a laughable figure. So is yeah. that, is that our, your own expectation? And will that have uh, a consequence on demand and prices going forward? Well, it will have a consequence on prices, absolutely. As far as demand is concerned, there is demand. Demand is there, right? I don't think nobody's going to stop turning off their heat. Nobody's going to stop buying stuff. <laughs> no, nobody's, I mean, you know, you have to drive, you have to ship stuff, you have to, the demand's there, right? And, and that's, um, it is, uh, you know, unless the world shuts down again. Right. It's not uh, demands, not as elastic as one might think. You just can't shut off global trade. Um, you know what I'm saying? So um, and you can't, you know, you're going to turn on your heat. You're going to turn on your air conditioning. People are going to go about their lives the way that they are used to going about their lives. They're not going to, you know, stop unless obviously you're forced to, um, you know, unless you shut we shut down the world again, which hopefully that never happens again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, my own theories on that, right? Everyone knows. I know, own. I know. But you know, what's interesting is even if we look at um, Europe right now in the UK, even since they've had these new lockdowns, right, initiated in, in the fall, we're still seeing uh, high frequency mobility data that they're much more active than they were, you know, back this, this 2020 spring. Um, when everything shut down. So people are still moving about, people are still driving, there's still traffic, um, there's still a ton of more shipping going on and things like that. Um, perhaps because it wasn't such a coordinated shutdown, right? You're just seeing this in, in areas. Um, so, but that isn't, you know, it is interesting that we are still seeing um, activity 
like almost double the activity than we did when uh, the first shutdowns happened. And there's a lot of questions here, so I'm going to get to those questions. And after I have one last question, because it was my third follow up from before, and uh, I let you get away without answering it. I told you, but right? <laughs> yeah, already in Nordstrom, I uh, I see that there's a lot of uh, debate about it, and I feel uh, kind of neglected because I can't contribute my uninformed opinion to it. Whatsoever. Oh, okay. So Nord Nord Stream Two, right? Yeah. Can you help me and I suppose everybody else? understand what it is and uh kind of what it is in competition with american political and economic national interest and, and everything else right so Nord Stream 2 is basically it's a russian gas pipeline to germany um and it's for europe it's you know it's natural gas which i'm a big fan of uh over the next couple of years um and uh, in into germany into europe basically and it's cheap abundant you know it, it, but it's from Russia, <laughs> um, which, you know, there are arguments to the fact that uh, the United States is politically against uh, this for two reasons. There is the camp that thinks that it's because the U.S. wants to be the one to ship uh, natural gas to, uh, to Europe, which I'm not 100% sure perhaps that was um, perhaps that was the prior administration's one of their uh, one of their things. Um, I, I'm not sure that this administration that is really their uh, their the reasoning why they are against it. I, I don't think that's part of their argument. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, and I say that because, you know, you have East Med Gas, Southern Gas Corridor, um, things like that. There's a lot of things going on that, you know, we can get gas gas to Europe as well um, that are that are new. Um, but so there's that that argument that the U.S. wants to be the one to, to sell Europe natural gas. Right. Um, and then there's the other, other argument that it's because of Russia specifically. Right. And they don't want uh, it's a security issue, not only actually uh, for the the United States, even though we're not over there, but, um, you know, there are several European countries also that don't exactly welcome this pipeline as well uh, because of the ties, uh, the geopolitical ties uh, that, that that would bring and um, having to become, you know, having watched things in the Ukraine, et cetera, and, Russia shut off their gas so many times, um, you know, there's a worry that that possibly could happen um, to Europe, to Germany. Right. Oh, interesting. So I didn't realize that part of that is the uh, volatility and the vulnerability that Germany and the rest of Europe would have to Russia shutting off the pipeline. Right. Um, because they, he, they've they seen that done in uh, other Western European countries that, that are mostly dependent on Russia for gas. So in your own analysis and with, and with your clients and with hedge fund tele, uh, telemetry and, and to the subscription thing, because I love it, I'm a big fan, as you know, um, do you uh, anticipate uh, that going forward? Is there kind of an inevitability to it? Um, yes. I mean, I, you know, Germany is, Germany is very poor for it, right? They're of the stance right now that, look, it's almost done. We might as well just finish it. Uh, Merkel is, you know, uh, is friends with Putin, right? They speak Russian when they're together. They uh, they do have a relationship. So she's been very pro uh, Nord Stream 2. And there's also the, you know, there's kind of the, the thing where, you know, I think, you know, Germany is kind of like we don't want the U.S. telling us what to do. <laughs> and is there a, I saw, I think it was, um, because I don't know anything about this. So I think I saw Darren Beatty commenting on there's a difference in, and he's not an energy analyst. So I, again, I'm just picking up opinions, but I'm very interested in them, that there's a difference in the quality um, of uh, the Nordstrom versus the alternatives that America would have a, a greater national interest in. No, I don't think, I mean, Russia is the number one natural gas producer in the world. It's not, I don't think that it's a quality issue. Is there, I, think, I think it's a political issue. Interesting, interesting. So there's a lot of questions here. And uh, I so appreciate that everybody bared with me for mine. 
uh, and yours are better. Everyone else's are better, but uh, I just needed to get these out of my head. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, Timothy Heidegger, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Timothy says, and you got to get a picture also. Oh, you're on YouTube. That's awesome. I love YouTube. So uh, Timothy Heidegger asks, uh, Tracy, does your energy capex include additional resilience baseload? Um, is, is, does my energy capex? What do you? I'm not sure what you mean. My energy capex. In terms of in terms of your analysis of going it, forward, and could you help everybody else participate in that question as well? Um, so yeah, I mean, looking, I'm just for my analysis, looking at CapEx, right? Um, we just literally don't have, um, we, we just don't have, have the, we don't have it that, that in place because we have, you know, you've looked at all the big majors right now, right? They're all except for, um, Exxon, right? You have Shell and BP basically jumping ship, <laughs> right? They've kind of basically turned their business models around their big oil wanting to be a renewable company where uh, Exxon uh, kind of is staying within their lane, right? So, and I think that, um, and I think that I'm kind of getting off the subject, but I wanted to finish that thought. Um, but but I think that, you know, ExoM, I think their strategy, although they initially got kind of uh, a bad rap for that, um, I think that it will pay off in the future because we are going because of the lack of capex and because everybody else kind of um, jumping ship into the the, the renewable zone. And so, um, Anon, thank you so much for joining us on Periscope too. So I like that uh, I now have two kind of channels. I think it's pretty cool. So Anon says, "What legislation should we expect when it comes to nuclear power in the Biden administration?" No, that's going to be very interesting because what we are seeing really is, you know, we've kind of seen the West kind of shun nuclear a little bit, right? Um, there's about 444 nuclear reactors um, active in the in the world today. There's about 50 new projects that are literally being built now, but those are primarily primarily in Asia. So we see that it's in China, Russia, uh, UAE, and Bangladesh. Um, is where the concentration of those are. Um, then we have another 50 reactors that are being planned. Um, and we see those kind of more in Africa, Tunisia, uh, Algeria, Morocco, um, Kenya, Sudan. Um, so we're kind of seeing a pro proliferation of nuclear um, in in major mostly in africa and in asia right now whereas the, the west right still thinks of kind of uh chernobyl um fukushima right and kind of has backed off of that um europe has closed down a lot except for france again um and the united states has closed some reactors so i think the biden administration doesn't have a real clear mandate on nuclear However, the progressives within that party are um, against nuclear. So it will be interesting kind of to see, um, you know, going forward, we just don't have enough information from this administration yet to be able to really tell what direction they're really going to take that in. And do you expect a direction to be given? Do you expect it to be in terms of uh, the diplomacy of kind of, of language? Or are you expecting some type of explicit legislation? Um, I would think not explicit legislation. I think we'll see it more in um, not anything that pertains to nuclear, but I'll, I think you'll see that in, say, um, incentives or EPA laws, um, things like that. I think that's where you're going to kind of get clues on, you know, if they're going to push nuclear. I don't think they're going to come right out and go gung-ho nuclear just because of the negative connotation that it has. You know, it's going to, I think there's, the West needs to be sort of re-educated on, on, on nuclear and new technologies and things like that for it to become really more accepted. And so I hate to, uh, you know, give an appearance of kind of a partisan type of thing. So that's, I want to just say, I'm going to ask a question, but I uh, hopefully everyone will understand and not from the partisan side of it, but just in terms of competing policy interests side of it is were you within your industry did you look at the trump administration being more um not just favorable in terms of their rhetoric right but in terms of the ac actual actuals of what was occurring within the united states did you really did you see them being uh much more assertive 
in in terms of actual implementation of, of policy rather than the rhetoric? I mean, do you see a lot of difference between the Trump administration to the Biden administration? Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And this is not, I'm just, you know, um, Trump, Trump administration came in with some very clear mandates, right? And things that they and uh, wanted to accomplish, whether they did or not is, you know, they still came in with some very clear goals on some very clear policies. Um, the Biden administration has, uh, has come in with some clear policies, right? A little bit of the Green Deal infrastructure. Um, but we really haven't seen anything, you know, it's still very early within the administration, right? And still, you know, within the, the first month. Um, so really, you know, we kind of have to see exactly what what more of their mandate is. I mean, we, have, we haven't really seen much of this administration. We've had a bunch of executive orders, um, but they don't really give us a clear stance on, except for, you know, the Keystone Pipeline. Um, they don't really give us a clear stance on what their forward thinking policy is going to be. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So going back to nuclear, right? I promised you. And uh, Rose AKF, so Ross AKF, so thank you so much for joining us again, right? Is uh, does nuclear, and now let's refer to kind of internally within the United States, um, does, and uh, some of, this was, this question was actually posed when we were discussing California and uh, specifically we were discussing Texas. So within that kind of a framework, does nuclear solve any of these issues? Well, it certainly would, it certainly would help. Um, it, it, I mean, it certainly would help. And I mean, California does have does have nuclear, right? Um, they have quite a few. They have a few plants, but they are all in the south, I believe. Um, nothing up north. Um, does it solve any? It, I, I, adding that into the mix certainly would help, right? And 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 it's green, and it's you know, it doesn't have the uh, weather related issues that you know, perhaps solar or wind. Uh, do. And so uh, Patrice, who lives in Germany and is so helpful <laughs> because news has become so siloed that uh, it's unfortunate that we really have no idea what's happening just a couple of miles away from us. So we certainly have no idea about what's happening thousands of miles away from us uh, on kind of the substantive issues that don't always make it onto social media. So this is very interesting. Patricia says that in 2019, more than 2 million people in Germany couldn't afford heating in winter. That's, again, you know, that's a problem with in Germany's infrastructure, right? They got rid of the, they got rid of nuclear um, and they have all of these uh, things that are, that are more expensive. And then, you know, and they have this carbon, uh, carbon tax that's, uh, you know, so um, how they are doing it is, the way that you don't want to do it, the way that you don't want to do it. Yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, I see a question and I'm going to respond to it. Um, so let me just find this. So um, because I'm going to be doing a follow up on nuclear energy and um, we, the on the third one, we had Mark Schneider, which I know is really, really popular. And um, and we're going to do one. I think it is with Aco Energy, with Aco Nuclear. Uh, and I've I've spoken with them, and I'm really excited. And it's also interesting because it's a it's a woman founded company, and uh, oh, yeah. it is isn't that cool? That's cool. I'm all for that. Yeah, and it's uh it's actually one of the most innovative companies, if not the most, in uh, in nuclear. All right, I'm looking forward to that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. I, I am also. So yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so Janan Glasgow. So I'm I'm and I'm also not sure, Tracy, if. Uh, if you can respond to this, just because I don't know if it's part of your own kind of analysis within hedge fund tele tele telemetry and with your own hedge fund, private family clients. But so Janan Glasgow says microgrids, companies like Google and Apple and Amazon are making their own. Right. And so that comes down to and energy and electricity is not really something that I cover. Right. <laughs> um, I'm more, uh, you know, uh, focused on energy, but not electricity and grids. That's definitely not my forte. But, um, you know, I, my opinion on this is that, yes, Apple, Google, Amazon, big tech is doing that. But then um, you're kind of beholden to big tech. So um, it's a trade-off. Amazon, Google, Amazon, 
Yeah, it is. And so, uh, and, and I'm kind of anti megacorp, although right. uh, I see it's good and it's bad. It's good because they have a uh, horde. Right. I mean, you know, they're planning on making all these smart cities and smart grids, but again, that, that's, that has to be, you know, I, I think that's just a per personal issue that, um, you know, you can have these companies build these out, but then again, you're beholden to, to them. Right. Yeah. And, and being surveilled by them and innovation. And it's not really just a surveillance because actually I can kind of live with the surveillance provided it's got more regulatory oversight and there's more kind of an ethical quality to it, which I said, I think we're missing, but I really? think that the, um, uh, the having too much of a reliance on the megacorps is, uh, is just, is, is just kind of dangerous. And I've you know discussed this in non-investor series periscopes, but uh, it's dangerous when we're kind of displaced in the constitution with the terms of service, uh, which is a lot more negotiable than is, you know, the constitution and a bill of rights and, you know, kind of the dual, the dual sovereignties that states have. So I want to, uh, I want to move on. So, um, so Jane Love, thank you so much for being here. And that's a very nice picture that you've used. And it looks like, is that a yellow flower? Is that what that is? It looks Jane like it. It is. It's very nice. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Jane Love says, and we're going back to Texas now. So Jane Love says that's part of the problem because Texas can't draw energy from other states when they need to. Yes, that's I'm, that. Is, I, you know, that is correct because their grid is not because their grid is separate. Although it's, I mean, their grid doesn't actually include all of Texas. Right. Um, if you look at a map of, of their grid, there's some outer parts of Texas. You have part of it kind of going into Oklahoma. Um, so their grid isn't perfectly, you know, the shape of Texas. <laughs> right. But it's true. I, I mean, um, you know, I think uh, the governor just came out and said they and I would question the legality of this, but, you know, just came out, I think this morning or last night and said um, they weren't going to allow not gas to, to leave the, the state. Now I, I'm again, not sure uh, how legal that is. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that, that's part of the, the issue. And so, uh, and, and we're going to need your help kind of deciphering this question as well. At least I will. Right. So uh, Jim Ioria, thank you so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Says, is the population, is the pop in crude price? Oh, excuse me. Is the pop uh, yeah. Is so he's looking, asking, are we overextended? In other words, has yeah, this rally gotten too far ahead of us? Let me let me just ask the question so that for people who aren't seeing this right now and so they're, or they're going to listen to it. So Jim Ioria, again, thank you so much for joining us. Big fan. Says, is the pop, is the increase in crude prices too reactionary? And uh, Tracy, it's all yours. Yes, I, I mean I think that the that the popping crude is uh, very reacting, right? I think it's a little little getting a little bit ahead of itself. However, it's feeding on itself because of the shape of the curve right now. We're in backwardation, so there's a positive roll uh, yield on that. So if you look at, um, I mean, if you look at WTI, the roll yield is about eight percent, and you know. What's the yield on the 10 year right now? Like 1.3% or, or something like that. So it's, it's feeding on, it, it's feeding on itself. Right. Uh, but yes, I do think the market to answer the question, I think the market's gotten a little bit ahead of itself at this point. Um, but again, I, I think that's because of the structure of the curve right now, which is in backwardation. But that does, also doesn't mean that bubbles Oh, I, I, you know, and you didn't describe it as a bubble. So that was my own. I, I don't think, no, I don't think it's a bubble. And I do think prices are are going up. Do I think that it, we've gotten a little too ahead of ourselves um, at this point? Uh, you know, I, I would say yes. I would uh, not be surprised if we saw a pause in prices, prices soon. But again, you know, I think it's feeding off of the, itself because of the, the structure of the curve, right? If you're an investor, um, it pays, you get paid to buy the back months, right? And um, you get, because the curve structure, that front month's higher price. So you buy lower and, um, you know, you just keep rolling up and you're making yield on that. And, uh, and thank you so much. We're going to continue. So, and I'm going to respond in part to this. And I see that you've made some comments on this, again, both in hedge fund uh, telemetry and your own kind of work there. And uh, I'm sure you've done it with your own internal clients. And uh, I, I, it's a subject of a lot of conversation. 
Uh, so, uh, 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 Mr. Y Singapore, thank you so much for joining us. Um, or MRY Singapore. I don't want to misrepresent what that says. So, uh, thoughts on commodity super cycle starting and possible rare earth shortage uh, for the F-35 and for other type of uh, initiatives. Um, yes, I do think that uh, we are starting a commodity super cycle. Um, you know, I think that we're going to see just with the advent of, you know, of renewables, uh, you know, things like that, we're going to see, you know, metals, uh, you know, we're already starting to catch up metals and, and I'm not talking precious metals. That's kind of a different kind of metals, but base metals, um, metals used for, uh, solar, uh, wind, et cetera, um, uh, as well as oil, because I think oil prices are, you know, and energy prices in general are set, set to go higher. Um, and rare earths, yes, actually, I just was talking about this and just was writing about this, is I think that with the, it's, it's not really rare earth shortage, it was China saying, we may not uh, sell the U.S., you know, rare earths for their defense anymore, right? So I think, again, you know, that just stress, which, you know, I kind of talked about at the beginning of this pandemic, right, um, that we were having supply chain issues because we were not diversified enough, right? We were all too dependent on China. And when China shut down that first, right, it affected everybody else's um, supply chains. In fact, it's still, you know, it's still affecting supply chains. It's still having a ripple effect, even from almost a year ago. Um, so to me, when they came out and said, and then this was just a couple of days ago, um, that we may not sell or we're thinking about or the, the inclination was, you know, we don't want to sell to the US Defense Department anymore. Now, whether that's comes to fruition or not, the mere fact that they said it is just kind of a reaffirmation of the of the, our need to diversify uh, supply chains away from China. And it's not only China. I mean, we should have diversified. If this pandemic taught us one thing, is that we should have diversified supply chains everywhere, right? We should have multiple sources for um, multiple things. Um, but in this particular case, that's actually an advantage for the United States, right? Because we're looking at starting mines here. Um, so there could be opportunities within the United States in the rare earth um, sector. Uh, thank you very much for that. That was really informative. And so Wizard Predicts, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm a big fan of Wizard Predicts. Um, I, uh, Wizard. Wizard Predicts, I, you know, I, I like Wizard. I like that. Wizard predicts. Yeah, and I'm so um, disengaged from politics, right? I'm an investor, and all of us are kind of investors, so we're all really just trying to ski to where the puck is going. So for me, I think of politics, uh, I take out the rhetoric, and I just think of uh, kind of what happens next and how can I benefit from that, uh, and how can I be on the right side of a trade? That's always what I'm trying to look to do, right? Uh, and so I'm a big fan of Wizard Predicts because it's one of the few places where I uh, reliably take down uh, political information so I can stay uh, abreast of what's happening. So uh, I've got very few places where I draw down information from. I'm very selective about what I let into my head and what I let into my computer. And uh, Wizard Predicts, uh, thank you so much for joining us because uh, you're one of them. So. Um, this question is really interesting because your last picks, as we discussed uh, right at the opening of this, was Parsley Energy, which was acquired two months after your recommendation of it, and Devon and Devon Energy, which is doubled. It's actually now more than doubled from uh, from when you recommended it. You said to keep your eye on them and and uh, and, and you recommended it. So you have uh, you've you've beaten the market, and uh, you're competing with. Uh, with Bitcoin, right? You're in that. <laughs> you're in Bitcoin. I don't think so. <laughs> you're in Bitcoin league, so that's awesome. And you're actually uh, in Tesla league also. So you're uh, you're a top performing asset to, for us, Tracy. So thank oh, you. So yes. Much. <laughs> you are. No, you're remarkable. So thank you so much. So Wizard predicts is what are the good companies we should be looking at currently? What are the good buys? All right. So what am I? I will say what I'm looking at currently. So I still think I'm gonna take that gas, right? Because we're gonna see such growth um, in that gas in um, 
in uh, in Asia and, and Africa. And so I'm still looking at some of the companies that I was looking at there before, not necessarily US gas, but I'm still looking at Dalek um, Energy, um, Energian. I, I still really like that are involved in uh, the Southern Gas Corridor. Um, uh, what else? Um, who else is in there? Um, uh, oh, in Africa, we have uh, Mitsui, we have ONGC, we have ENH, uh, we have uh, Barrett Petro Resources, we have uh, India Oil. Um, so if I'm looking at Nat Gas, I'm kind of looking not in the U.S. Um, for things that I am looking at um, in the U.S., um, just because there are, there, you know, I, I, I just think there's more opportunity uh, investment wise in the, in those areas right now. And there's just so much focus um, in those areas. So that's why I prefer natural gas companies, but not in the U S <laughs> um, then in the U S actually, what I think is really interesting that not a lot of people are talking about right now is um, believe it or not is uh, green uh, is green or renewable biodiesel. Um, not people aren't really talking about that right now. So um, the people that are involved in that are Marathon and Valero. So MRO and VLO. I really like those. They've kind of made nice runs, but I think, you know, um, you know, if you can get something on a pullback, uh, I think those two companies, as far as refining are concerned, are exciting. I'm writing all these down. I'm actually sending, <laughs> sending a text uh, to, uh, to uh, my assistant as we speak, who's in uh, who's in India right now, who's been stuck in India now for quite some time. So I would just want to go over those companies and uh, just kind of some reiteration of, of what they are and how you're kind of categorizing them. So you said, uh, I think in uh, overseas exposure and developing countries exposure, right. it was Dalek, Mitsui. Mitsui, Barry. yep. So let's just go over them. Let's just go over them slowly, if, if you don't mind, because uh, I need to take this in, right? I need, I need to let it echo a little bit in my head. So it was Dalek, Mitsui, right. uh, Barrett, right. India, Barrett oil, India, right. oil, and then India Oil. Um, you have ONGC, um, and um, and yeah, Ofer Energy. Actually, it's interesting. Um, Pavilion Energy. Um, these are these have uh, natural gas product pro project can't speak natural gas projects in Africa. Um, what else am I looking at right now? You see, if we look at Russia, actually, um, what's interesting is that you know uh, Russia basically has you know their government uh, run. Uh, company that that does all of their natural gas but Rosneft is actually looking at possibly um, getting getting a contract which would uh, really uh, give them a much larger piece of the market um, in in the, the natural gas realm so should that uh, initiative go through I, I like Rosneft and their biggest partner actually in the projects in Eastern Siberia, um, their biggest partner there is Exxon. Oh, interesting. Wow. The world is such a complicated place, right? <laughs> and then in, uh, you mentioned within the, within the U S so in, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the U S right now I, that I'm actually, I'm looking at re two refiners that I particularly like right now are Marathon, MRO, and um, Valero, VLO, uh, in sp specifically because of their uh, renewable um, uh, diesel. Because um, they have, they have, uh, they're the two that have projects going on. And um, I think it's going to be, um, big in the future because you can use you don't have to change anything that you do you can use this you know in your in your diesel tank you literally the uh, specifications are the same so um you can use that without having to alter um any kind of engine gas tank etc and do you and what do you use as a leading indicator for um where you expect those stocks to go in the health of the industry for as far as what all the all the ones that I'm looking at or yeah all the ones that you're looking at because you know 
you were asked about crude oil in, in part one, and then crude oil obviously is just done fantastic. I mean, uh, and I did take some positions there as well. Uh, huh? And I was even thinking about taking physical inventory positions. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just that's kind of big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very lucky because we have a syndicate with within the family office. So uh, oh, cool, that, cool. that we brought on, and some of them are just crazy. They're crazy people. So, what? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're, yeah, yeah, they're they're crazy people. Oh, yeah. They're they're awesome, and uh, <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of their work because uh, actually they're not. It's not that they're big risk takers. Uh, they're not. They're uh, they're they're very uh, into the the uh, math. They're very into the arithmetic of their investments. So for them, uh, they made a very compelling argument on uh, cool. Not the, not the geometry of it, but really the arithmetic of it was really interesting. Um, it was actually a little bit too rich for my blood. They don't mess around. <laughs> so what are the what are the leading indicators that you look at beyond just kind of the the spot prices and, and the current market prices? Well, I, you know, I'm kind of looking at trends in uh, what business trends, right? What what people are doing, what where you know what projects are hot, what's happening right now, like what, where are people spending money right now? Right? In which countries are they spending money? Um, as far as the infrastructure of the of those countries, you know, is it an investable area, right? Or is the you know you have to consider, especially if you consider places like Africa, um, you know, you have to consider is the government uh, you're going to have problems with the government? Or are you going to have problems with uh, locals? Or are you going to have problems? So you know, you kind of have to take all those factors in um, when I'm looking at. You know, because I kind of do like a top down analysis. OK, where, you know, I kind of, you know, read all of this stuff. I'm, mostly I put it on Twitter. If I'm thinking about it, it's kind of my notepad. Right. Until I kind of get a story together um, and then I kind of drill it down down to there. And, you know, um, you know, I, that's kind of led me down this um not kind of not not my new thing. I mean, I love oil. I still, you know, but I kind of got my I have my investment thesis already, um, already kind of the, the groundwork's already you know laid for that. I already have my thesis on that, right? And and not that I don't update my thesis, but um, so nat gas is was the next thing that kind of really caught my eye. Um, so there's all kinds of factors that that I you know you you kind of look look in mostly a lot of it's for. Uh, you know, is there demand and who's, where's the money? Follow the money, you know, where's it's, the money going? <laughs> one of the things I found very interesting is that um, I, uh, you know, I started this because I was looking at kind of sector rotations because clearly the world has a lot of volatility right now and the world has a lot of kind of new uh, financial and investment opportunities where it's no longer just so narrowly within the United States. So I, I expect the stock markets in the U.S. to easily double, you know, even perhaps triple very, very quickly from here, um, which uh, which might sound ludicrous to some. But keep in mind, I've been in the stock market. You know, I had my own shop and I worked on Wall Street since uh, 1990, actually since 1987. I came into the stock market the week before it crashed. And wow. uh, I <laughs> I'm the biggest bull ever. I guess myself and Jim Shaughnessy and Kip Herridge and a few others are the biggest bulls ever. And, uh, you know, despite what appears to be kind of uh, turbulence, I look at, I, I've been through all these, tur through the through turbulence and rhetoric and kind of political arguments before. And, uh, you know, America is, is just America, right? I'm so impressed and I'm just so proud. At the same time, I see that we're we're really now finally seeing a uh, build up in Africa and in the developing countries. Something that you know had been only speculation before is now kind of really happening, where they're really getting nuclear, they're really getting coal. The demand is increasing, so uh, I'm you know I'm very interested in what those opportunities are overseas. So it's interesting that you mentioned those in terms of Africa. Yes, I mean, there's a, I mean, there's just there's a lot of money being poured into that. And you also I mean, I think for, um, you know, emerging markets, especially in Africa, you know, um, natural gas, you know, natural gas is a really um, it, it, it's it's a cleaner energy. I, I would you know, it's not clean energy. It's not green energy, but it's clean, a lot cleaner than oil um, or coal. 
right? That that a lot of it's currently used. So um, and it's cheap and uh, relatively <laughs> and abundant, right? A lot of uh, so you know for for them it's I just. For me, or for them, it just naturally makes sense that you know that would be a place to go and um, build out that that infrastructure. Now, do you look at uh, the um, instability of, for example, in Nigeria? Do you look oh. at the instability of the Buhari government? Oh, absolutely, and I think we kind of touched on this a little bit last time when you know talking about oil and gas, you know, there's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you have to, um, obviously, Nigeria's had a lot of problems, right? They've had um, pipelines attacked. They've had, you know, people stealing oil. They have, I mean, you know, they've had, they've had, they've had, a, they've had a lot of, a lot of problems within uh, the energy world, certainly. Um, but, you know, I think they, they have a very young population, uh, very, very innovative. Um, so hopefully that, you know, hopefully the, the future is bright for them. And uh, we're gonna skip on because there's so many questions here. Now we're gonna go back to uh, kind of the requirements for the Green New Deal and requirements for infrastructure, which I'm actually delighted about. I think that there's a lot of rhetoric and I'm, I'm afraid of some of the things I've read from Stiglitz. I read his book, his new book, and I know he was gonna be a Warren advisor. And, uh, it was all very. Uh, I think he was promising something like ten million new jobs. So it was a little. It was a little bit bizarre, right? That's a uh, lot of jobs. It is, and uh, how uh, what those jobs were going to be, he didn't even bother saying in a three hundred page book. He never mentioned what those jobs were going to be. But uh, that is what it is, because there is unknown and there's unknown unknowns. I accept those. So little Herc, thank you so much for joining us. Says, will we need new technological advances in infrastructure before building a new ground up grid? Um, I'm sure. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not an engineer <laughs> at all. Um, but talking to other engineers, yeah, I mean, I, you know, and, and, th and that's where, you know, that would be if we could afford it and we could do it, that's a great, huge job, jobs push as well. Right. Um, because you would need to hire a bunch of engineers and uh, you know, architects and, and, and things of that nature. So, um, I, you know, I'm not an engineer. Um, but I would assume that, um, you know, a new technology would uh, probably um, be needed. And I'm sure there are companies that are actually already working on that. And we're now we're almost going to be in a speed round. We're in a speed round right now. We're in a speed round. We're, we're in a speed round? All right. No, we're in the Jeopardy round, right? <laughs> so we're in the Jeopardy round, which is not the fastest speed round. Fastest speed round is the end, which is like that family feud, right? When one, all the family members go back, but that one person who's got to like rattle off everything. So Valina, thank you so much for joining us. And Valina is going to be doing a YouTube, and I'm very impressed, discussing gold. Um, right. So it is, and I'm so interested in uh, in gold, and she's going to be doing it with Jim Rickard. So I'm a real fan of that. I think it's going to be yeah. a lot of fun. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I expect to be doing something about gold also with Luke Roman. So I'm very interested in the direction that Valina finds for it, right? So Valina says, or asks, what is the future outlook uh, about petrochemicals? Actually, petrochemicals is one of the fastest growing industries, right? Um, and you just saw Saudi Arabia, um, Aramco by Sabic. Um, you're seeing a lot of more interest. And you also have to think a lot, these, a lot of these petrochemical companies uh, make things like um, fertilizer <laughs> and things that we're going to need for uh, agriculture, which I also is another big theme of mine uh, in the future, uh, you know, going into the future, it's another investment theme of mine uh, on sort of on the materials end. So I think it's only, you know, I think it's only set to grow actually, because I think we're gonna have growing needs in a lot of industries um, such as agriculture and, and things like that. <clears throat> that I think that that more products will will be made for that. And there's there's a part two, and I think he might be a colleague of uh, of Alina, and it's uh, Professor Michael Tancham. Um, oh, and yes. he's been writing a lot about, and in fact, I want to have him as a guest, right? About uh, the Baltic region and also uh, uh, about Turkey and uh, a lot of new finds uh, that have been having. And what do you kind of anticipate? from those both political turbulence, because I know that's an issue you described, and, and also in terms of supply and demand. 
So, I, I mean, it, you know, we're seeing a more kind of conflicts in, in, in that region um, ever since we've had, I, I don't know which angle really to start start this question with. Um, we're seeing a lot of conflict in that in that area, right? In that area, not, you know, in the Middle East um, with the change of administrations, right? Uh, we're seeing increased activity kind of um, uh, in the Horn of Africa and in the Middle East and uh, with Turkey, with Syria, right? Um, things are kind of escalating a bit there. So um, it's definitely an area that I would watch because there's a lot of natural resources there, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the actual question is, but, it, you know, as far as supply and demand is concerned, you know, it's still an area that, again, has a lot of resources, um, has a lot of tension going forward. Um, we kind of we're starting to initiate some peace. And right now we'll have to see kind of how the Biden administration approaches that area um, as far as foreign policy is concerned to see if uh, some of this simmers down a lot. But um, yes, I mean, the, the, again, East Med uh, Gas Corridor, Turkey, there's you know a lot of areas that, that uh, there's a lot of new NAT gas fines um, that you know are very exciting. And uh, we're going to continue. And so uh, thank you so much for that, Valina. It was actually a two-parter. I just didn't tell you oh, about okay. the second part for a while. Right. I didn't see the second question. I would have answered that better. All right. Anyway, go on. <laughs> My fault. My bad. But it's a lunch, right? It's a lunch and kind of we're from right. these things, right? So Rising Serpent, thank you so much for joining us, says, uh, and uh, are renewable energy sources more susceptible to cyber attacks and less resilient to recovery? Um, I don't think that they're any more susceptible to, you know, it's, uh, everything is run right electronically these days, right? Even, um, even, uh, you know, I mean, uh, even in the, the, the gas and oil industry, right? Um, they're all susceptible to, they're all susceptible. I don't think that renewables are necessarily more susceptible than, than the others, right? It just depends on what your cybersecurity is, um, you know, for, for your infrastructure. But uh, I guess the answer is, I don't think they're any more or less susceptible than any other uh, type of industry at this point. And um, so um, Gosha was thoughtful enough to join us yesterday. And uh, I, I know that uh, they said that I pronounced their name correctly. So I'm going to attempt it again. Uh, and hopefully it's the same way I said it yesterday, which was Gosha Koreshi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Says on the assumption Peasant Airlines, which is pretty funny. I'm going to think about that now. On the assumption airlines never come back in terms of just uh, pleb travel. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> um, how does the energy outlook? Uh, what What is the energy outlook? Well, I do think airlines will come back. But again, I think we kind of discussed this a little bit earlier. What we are seeing is where, you know, we are having... Um, where we still are not seeing any demand in the airline industries, we are seeing that being picked up by uh, maritime shipping, by cargo shipping, by um, by trucking, by rail. Um, so you know, as you know, as global trade increases, right, we're going to have uh, more demands um, in sort of the, the shipping industry and things like that. I mean, in fact, a lot of planes are now being used for cargo instead of, you know, a lot of commercial planes have, you know, older commercial planes have turned into cargo planes because we are having a cargo plane shortage. So, um, you know, I think demand picks up, you know, when, you know, you, you kind of demand falls in one area, demand picks up. But, you know, I do think airlines will come back though, just so you know, just for anybody else that is excited to travel like I am, I think airlines are going to come back. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I actually was recently on a, a couple of airlines and uh, it's, uh, they are definitely coming back. I, I do worry about the, uh, I think the airlines come back. I'm actually very worried. I I'm actually very much more worried about the jobs in retail at the airports because those are so uh, economically sensitive to um, the labor costs and uh, to, um, you know, the, the uh, per what do they want? What, what is the, the new term that I should use? Perhaps the person hour cost. Uh, oh, person hour? 
I'm happy with saying manpower cost, but I, I want to be respectful. <laughs> is it person, person power now? <laughs> yeah, perhaps it is, I think, and I want to be respectful for whatever the term is, right? Is okay. that uh, you know, with with a coming fifteen dollar an hour wage right. before in two thousand nine, in two thousand one, the minimum wage was around uh five dollars when uh, the economy was coming out of, when the economy was recovering from September 11th. So 2001, 2004, the, you know, the uh, minimum wage was around $5. In 2009, the minimum right. wage was around 7 to $8, right? And, um, and the, the uh, industry was able to recover. But now at $15 an hour, you're, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's less resiliency, right? There's less opportunities to, you know, to arbitrage that. And um, it kind of shifts, you know, it dislocates the, the, the cost onto less human capital. So I think that the airlines come back. I see that. Uh, and I see, I've seen a lot of travel. Unfortunately, right now, I think it's more the affluent that are traveling because, you know, we can stay for two weeks here and there and, you know, comply with the obligations a lot more or pay the penalty, which is cool too. But I think that they come back, but I think that those retail jobs, are, uh, are 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 going to be lost. I worry about that. Those are uh, they're lower wage jobs, but uh, they're also kind of working moms and working parents. And I do think about that. Um, so um, Vijay Kumar, who is a real nuclear advocate, and uh, they're an expert actually. Why isn't healthy energy mix? Um, why hasn't the healthy energy mix become part of the narrative? And do you see that in your own forecast, more discussion of, of nuclear uh, incorporated within the rhetoric? Yeah, I mean, he's all right. I mean, I think that having a mix of, of all energies would, you know, as long as we can get them to integrate, right, um, better than we have been able to. Um, you know, I think an energy mix is um, one of the smartest things. And I don't, you know, it seems that like with everything, everything's kind of really divided, right? So you have the fossil fuel camp, again, against the renewable camp, and nobody's really talking about in, in integrating the two. Um, my focus was kind of like nuclear and that gas to um, kind of transition right? To kind of transition. But um, I agree. Absolutely. I, I mean, I agree. I think a healthy mix is the smartest way to go, really. And uh, it's interesting because now I'm also seeing comments on uh, on YouTube and hopefully I didn't miss them. So I'm going to scroll through just a little bit. Um, it's a little bit more difficult in YouTube, which is interesting. So um, so simple. Uh, Plavro 34, thank you again for joining says Suriname and uh, uh, Namibia were highlighted last time and there have been increases in investment there since. Have there been increases? Um, not so much. Uh, Suriname, I mean, the, it's kind of, uh, you know, old news. Uh, Namibia, yes, I mean, uh, there they, there has been an increase in investments in Namibia. Um, again, you know, we kind of talked about that. Nobody else was really talking about it right now. Um, now, you know, if you go Google it, it's all over. The, it's, you know, you'll find a, a ton of stuff. Well, not a ton, but definitely more so than you, you did. You didn't really see, find anything, um, you know, last August. But, um, yeah, there. that's, you know, again, that's, you know, I, I, I I kind of talked about that earlier. Um, uh, yeah, look for what was it? Reconnaissance Energy, right? They're one of the first to drill there right now. They were a wreck of mine before. Um, you know, should they find something there, then you know, I definitely still like that company. And uh, even, though up, even though it's up very big since then. <laughs> I know you discussed this before, but I do want to go into it a little bit more, right? Because it's become such a uh, protect, particularly a social media point of conflict, because, you know, I see a lot of political commentators that look at it from a Biden v. Trump thing, which I don't think is reasonable, right? We try and avoid these type of things. Um, so without Nordstrom 2, Germany will not reach uh, the energy wind. My apologies, I'm not good that's at bringing what they thought, That's their green, that's what they, that's in German, that's their green, green energy. That's what it's called in German. So can you help me understand in terms of uh, kind of the demand? Um, well, you know, I, again, I, I mean, I thought, well, that, that's, a, 
I don't think they're going to reach their goals. Which it depends on how you. I don't think they're going to. Re- I think their goals are going to cost the comp- the country too much money in general, right? Um, so you know, again, yes, you know, that's why Germany is kind of for this. You know, this 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 pipeline is for this uh, Russian natural gas. But again, there's a give and take on that. Do you want to be beholden to Russia at, at this? You know, at this juncture. And again, I think you know Germany needs to, um, I, I think their policy is, I, I think they need to reevaluate what they're doing because I think it's going to end up costing the citizens way too much money. Um, and I don't think that their plan is realistic. I'll just be blunt about it. <laughs> and uh, there's a continuation of this and I'm just so appreciative because I know so little about it. I see, you know, all the comments from the, the punditry, but I don't really pay attention to them because I kind of accept them as part of a, uh, kind of a, a cacophony, right? Uh, so Timothy Heidegger, thank you so much again. Uh, with Nordstrom too, Ukraine has seen cyber, natural gas, electric shutoffs. Um, uh, uh, and uh, they're discussing the uh, West Europeans geopolitical uh, quagmire qualms. Right. We, we, and we went over that earlier and that's exactly what their, their, you know, the fear is from other countries within Western Europe. Yeah, and um, so um, Shrikanth Ramanai, thank you so much. And this is a question about nuclear, but it also kind of affects your own kind of forecast for demand, right? Is uh, in California, is the nuclear being planned for retirement? And does that increase your expectations for uh, for fossil fuels and for cost? Um, yeah, is, is it? Uh, nuclear is being planned for retirement. Yes, you know we kind of went over this before. The West kind of has a negative connotation um, with with nuclear. So, um, and we kind of don't really know what you know what this administration you know what their push will be towards this. Um, as far as California, California needs uh, you know California needs a new plan. But we're kind of seeing, you know, we are seeing some kind of change of heart in California where, you know, um, we've actually seen a lot of cities that said, you know, no, we're not going to have natural gas in um, new buildings anymore. We've seen uh, Sonoma and a couple other counties kind of reverse their decision on that after everything that has happened. So, um, you know, perhaps their policy will, will change a little bit. And we're, and we're going to skip around because we're really in a, it's We've gone on for an hour and 22. My record is an hour and 43 minutes. And uh, that record has to stand. Okay. I think, that was, I think that was Dennis Wingo, perhaps, discussing Space Force. So uh, MRY Singapore, thank you again, says Berkshire Hathaway ups their oil and natural gas oh, yeah. with $6 billion investment in Japanese trading houses. Absolutely. Actually, Berkshire Hathaway um, has a, has a lot of uh, uh, investments in, in Japan. They, they just that came out just a few months ago. Um, Berkshire also has investments in U.S. oil and gas as well. Um, even though he got rid of Oxy, he picked up uh, CVX, I believe it was. So yes, they have a lot. Uh, he, Buffett likes oil and gas. Blue Horseshoe likes oil and gas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that brings us to some interesting questions, which is, and this is a two-parter. So because there, you only have a certain amount of room on, on, on Twitter to ask the question, so it's two-parters. So uh, Sonali, thank you so much for joining us. And I see you've chosen a new picture. So uh, that's awesome. And if I recall, you're in Malaysia. So it's really early for you, if I recall correctly. Um, and I usually do, right? So Texas failure of their power grid just implies renewable energy and Green New Deal is important. And then they can do that. Hold on. But with the Green New Deal signed, the current ongoing projects in oil and natural gas uh, might be stopped. Um. Well, there is a, not a new Green new green Deal. Nothing has been signed yet, right? And I think that this administration is cognizant of the fact that um, it would be against... We can't stop oil and gas, uh, U.S. oil and gas exploration. First of all, we we need it. Second of all, it's national security. Third of all, we make a lot of money selling it to other people. <laughs> so I don't think that 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 they're they're going to stop that. And uh, we're going to continue on. So thank you so much. So uh, Jesse McCatch, uh, Jesse Matchy, thank you so much for joining us. 
says, if I recall correctly, biodiesel's cloud point is higher, uh, is necessitating anti-gelling additives. Um, yes, I mean, the additives need to be do it, uh, added to it, but my point was we don't have to, you don't have to completely change your engine for that. Oh, you could have gone on, you could have gone on longer than that. We're in the speed speed. I don't, zone. I mean, there's not really that much to, I mean, there's, you know, yes, there's a, agents added to uh, biodiesel, just like there's agents added to ethanol. And so, uh, Eric Wolf, thank you so much for joining us. And that's a really nice tuxedo. And uh, I like tuxedos, right? Um, guys look at others' tuxedos because we always look at how they do the tie and, you know, how it's fashioned. There is an art form to it. Um, so Eric Wolf says, from an energy perspective, do you see a long-term integration of European and African oil markets? Um, integration as far as, I mean, there's a lot of um, European investment in African oil markets. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. <laughs> okay, so, Eric, so Eric, if you want to... Uh, if you want to uh, change to uh, rephrase the question a little bit so that it's uh, so that Tracy can respond to it, that'd be awesome. And then Sonali had a part three, right? I saw it before, but I wanted to, uh, I didn't do it in succession. So also as per Tracy, does the oil and gas energy companies, investors think about the climate crisis or no? Absolutely. Of course, the, the climate uh, climate is always um, in consideration. That's why there's con consistently new technologies to uh, make things cleaner, better, faster, more efficient, um, cut down on as much greenhouse uh, gases as possible. I think I mentioned, well, I haven't, didn't mention here, but uh, I talked about it on Twitter before. I think you're going to see carbon capture um, in this industry become uh become a really big thing it in the u.s it, it's it's bigger in europe but i think you're going to start seeing it being uh at the forefront of conversation um in the states right now and she's got a part four isn't that amazing isn't that awesome and so which are the renewable uh which are the renewable companies that you see as good buys in the usa or outside so my focus isn't really on uh renewable Companies, my focus is on fos the fossil fuel industry, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, but so I look for, you know, like, the, you know, things like renewable diesel, um, MRO, BLO, things like that. So we're going to go back to diesel. Uh, Jesse Machi continues with their thing, with their question. So if bullish on biodiesel, is there a corresponding anti-gelling company you're bullish on? And can you also explain a little bit of what that is? What it's just, I mean, it's just an additive needed uh, that you add. There, I mean, there's a million, there's a lot of additives in uh, gasoline, ethanol, biodiesel, diesel. Um, so th they're just additives added into the product so that it's usable by, by your engine. Right. Um, and you'll, you'll see that in any, any projects uh, to answer your question. No, I haven't actually gone down that road yet. Uh, but now I'm curious, so I'll po post something just on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would awesome. That would be awesome, and it brings us to a follow up question to that, right? So, uh, Calisthenics, who's one of my uh, Calisthenics, is one of the great historians. So you chose a, uh, a fantastic name. I discuss Thucydides so much, uh, and the his, you know, and, and the histories. And uh, let's not forget what a remarkable time that was for uh, for Macedon. And uh, how it led to the uh, conquest, you know, all the collapses of Sparta and of, uh, of Athens led to uh, led to uh, Philip II's plans coming into action. And so uh, Calisthenes, if I recall, was uh, the historian a little bit later on who, uh, who covered part of that. So uh, they say the, they say India will need a lot of fossil fuel uh, oils. How do we uh, retail investors ride along? And then they say, thank you, Tracy. <laughs> Yes, um, actually, he's right. India's India's uh, fossil fuel consumption is um, expected to double, whereas the West is, you know, expected to go down. So that is um, an emerging uh, market for uh, fossil fuels. So you could look at, you know, um, I mean, you can either invest in Indian companies like Indian refiners. Um, Indian oil company um, or uh, companies that service uh, that that service that industry and that service that that sell a lot of oil to um, India. And you can also look at petrochemical companies that that are you know that are servicing India. And uh, they responded. 
They said, uh, <laughs> Adam, the truth killed me. They're referring to Alexander the Great. Uh. So, you know, I'm, I'm such a big, such a big fan of the histories and I, I, I discuss it so much in uh, kind of my everyday thinking to myself and I share a lot of that on, uh, on, on, on Twitter. So um, everybody, we've been here for an hour and 29 minutes. So I'm going to really take a look at some of the last questions. And uh, I'm going to go back to this one because I found it so interesting. If, um, you know, we discussed Warren Buffett, but let's also, uh, could you give me a glimpse of what you see? Because Warren Buffett is definitely uh, part of the collateral of Warren Buffett is that once he does something, others will do it, right? That's the collateral of, of Warren Buffett. Uh, so can you discuss what you see just within your own clients, within interest, within um, – Within the interest within uh, with within your company, hedge fund uh, telemetry, and uh, just what what uh, kind of oligarchical leaders you're looking at for their own collateral and for their own leading indicators, and then kind of the follow up from Warren Buffett's investment. What happens next? I mean, I you know, as far as, I mean, I don't know all of his holdings. I just know um, you know the couple. Of, uh, I'm just talking about uh, oil and natural oh, gas okay. holdings. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, he's invested, I, you know, um, you know, in companies and in in Japan, um, you know, and and they're not all Japanese. Uh, they're not all Japanese companies in Asia. So I definitely think that because Asia is going to be a growing area for uh, fossil fuel usage, where the West is kind of trying to curtail their uh, consumption. Um, it's only building up in in Asia. There's a ton of coal plants. Uh, on uh, scheduled, there's a ton, they, and they have a greater mix, right? Because they're also looking at nuclear energy while they're looking at coal, while they're looking at nat gas, while they're also looking at renewables. Um, so Asia definitely has a broader mix of of energy. And so, and and it's a growing population. So um, we're seeing a lot of investment there, and we're also seeing um, a lot of growth there, and going to see a lot of growth there um, in all kinds of industry, all kinds of energy industries, not necessarily just um just nat natural gas or not just necessarily fossil fuels so and is six billion is six billion dollars considered a staggering investment or how do you look at that in terms of proportion and scale i i mean i for for berkshire hathaway i guess it's not that big not in terms of, in terms of relative but in terms of the uh the equity stake that they're taking and the size of their you know the stake that they're taking i don't i mean i don't think that's huge for berkshire hathaway it's not but in terms of the market itself, in, in terms, terms of the market itself, I mean, six billion dollars is um, a, a healthy investment. It's nothing staggering. It's nothing staggering. So now, do you look at other um, oligarchical type of houses? And do you, do you look at other kind of conglomerates like a Berkshire Hathaway now coming on and doing the same thing? I kind of look at maybe what some other. Uh, Funds are doing as far as you know, um, you know, carbon carbon trading seems to be huge right now, right? And some of these European hedge fund managers and things like that. Um, and I kind of, I mean, I look at kind of in general what they're doing, but I like, uh, you know, I like to find whatever what not everybody is doing, right? I want to find the next thing before it becomes the next thing. You know, I kind of look for smaller companies, smaller opportunities, not what everybody else is kind of doing. Because by the time you hear about them doing it, it's uh, the trade's kind of already over, right? They bought it months and months and months before it actually comes out. So, um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so do you worry when you say about, uh, you know, you want to get uh, skate to where the puck is going, which uh, I, I agree with that sentiment as investors, we all do. But do you worry about the government intrusion into the markets and legislating their way into the markets? Sure. And is there just a way of them, you know, pricing their way out of uh, an emissions crisis? So, I, I mean, yeah, well, look, at, I mean, you know, I, you have to look at what governments are doing. Absolutely. Right. And why we're seeing so many problems in Germany. Right. They're going to literally price themselves out of energy. <laughs> yeah, because I think in Germany, Germany really set the, the lead and. In terms of for them, there's a there's an obligation on the energy suppliers to source a proportion of their energy from renewables, right? right. And they have in Europe kind of a contracts for for a different. I think it's called contracts for difference, if I recall, uh, which guarantees certain low carbon electricity generators uh, a fixed price above the market rate 
um, right. paid by consumers, and that's a kind of a levy on energy suppliers. So, right, um, exactly, and that that's that's the problem is that you could be as a supplier, your uh, you have a problem, right? I mean, it kind of works both ways that it's against the consumer, right? Cause prices rise. But if you're a supplier, you're getting dinged as well on, on the opposite spectrum of that. Right. And so this might be our last question. I don't know because it's 134 and I really risk you beating the record. I can't let that happen. Okay. It's fixed. The fix is in. So the fix is in. <laughs> Uh, tuxedo guy, right? Uh, uh, clarifies your question. So they give us a lot more precision to it. So they say, uh, Europe diversifying of gas and oil supplies from Africa, European building and staffing of nuclear power plants. So they were really taking a look at kind of the interaction between the two markets. Yeah. And we, we kind of, we kind of talked about that before last time where, you know, we saw a lot of even European U ut utilities companies going into Africa and um, investing um, so that they could, you know, get uh, raw materials, natural resources, rare earths um, and things like that, all while helping them build out their infrastructure, um, you know, as kind of a symbiotic relationship there. So that's why you definitely, we're seeing a lot of, um, uh companies in europe uh, particularly in um particularly in africa germany being one of those um quite a few german utility companies are, have investments in africa helping not only helping africa but um, resourcing uh materials for themselves um and uh john dimitrio dimitri it might be dimitru but I'm not sure about the IOU and I speak several uh, different languages and I pronounce pronounce all of them horribly. So uh, John Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us. And that's a very nice picture of kind of like an electric guitar. So that's pretty cool. What type of US involvement are you expecting from the Biden administration in the Middle East? And how does that impact your own kind of projections in terms of prices and volatility? Um, I mean, uh, again, well, th this is always a very, uh, touchy subject. You know, um, I, I'm watching to see, as we can tell, right, we're seeing a, a lot of uh, foreign nations uh, in that area sort of test the Biden administration, right? We just had an um, incident in Iraq, um, you know, where Americans got killed. Um, so that's the closest it's been, but we're seeing, you know, we're seeing uh, more activity in Yemen, um, with Saudi Arabia, we're seeing more activity in Syria. Um, uh, we're seeing more activity in the Horn of Africa. Um, so we're going to see, uh, I, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me. Let's put it this way. If we see a lot of the old Obama administration foreign policy come into play, just because a lot of the same actors or characters are uh, within the cabinet again. So if you want to try to surmise what Biden's foreign policy, maybe it may be good to go back and kind of review what happened in the Obama administration. I'll put it that way. Here's a, here's a funny note, and I'm just including it because it's <laughs> funny, and then I'm probably going to uh, maybe regret it, but it is kind of funny, and I laughed at it. And so I'm like that kid in the classroom and uh, where the teacher says, you know, can you share with us that note that's being passed around? What and is it? Except I'm I'm horrible because I'm like that little kid that snitches and everyone passes me a note and then I just give it to the teacher and I inform on everybody. He said, um, "Sample Plevro 34 says, but wait, here comes some late uh, late arrival mailing questions." Uh. That's, it's funny. None of, us, none of us will comment on it because, uh, but it is funny, right? So I'm like that little kid that snitched. Uh, and again, Sample Plevro said, "But wait, here comes some late arrival mailing questions." Pretty fun. So we're going to close um, with this. And uh, you've responded to it, but uh, because I put it up there, it will be the last thing that people see. So isn't that kind of cool, right? I figured it out. And uh, I want to lastly discuss uh, in, in Periscope number one, which was in August 26, when you right. discussed Devon Energy and Parsley and gave us your leading indicators there. Uh, it was prior to your uh, work relationship with uh, hedge fund uh, telemetry. Right. And, uh, I'm such a big fan. So can you discuss that a little bit? Discuss. Uh, hedge fund telemetry. Discuss, yeah. discuss your subscription service there. 
And okay. uh, we subscribe and why, you know, why it's kind of important because it is, I subscribe to Patreons also. Uh, and uh, I, I very, I'm very picky and choosy about what I allow into uh, my head and even more so about what I allow into my investment thinking. Um, so yes, I mean, basically um, we're a research, a research firm and in investment, uh, research and investment advice, I guess, firm. Um, we have uh, for retail and institutional clients. Um, and I cover uh, materials and energy, right? And that, that includes everything my big, Sunday weekly includes, you know, everything from, you know, just how I look at everything from a macro view. So there's a lot of geopol geopolitics, et cetera, how everything's kind of affecting the industry, um, along with, um, you know, companies that I'm looking at, trade recommendations and, and whatnot throughout the week, um, updates throughout the week and things like that for the retail investor. And for um, anybody watching today, um, we'll put up... Um, uh, a link you can sign up and there's a code for um there's a code for uh discounts off uh your sus subscription yeah and uh i will say you know i'm very, always very cautious about kind of an endorsement and i try not to do that too much because i'm a, i call myself an extreme salesperson and uh, that awareness of it means i've got to be careful i'm like one of those trained mma fighters that I just can't get into like a bar fight because I'm, I'm so damaging to the, to my opponent that I'm also, uh, I don't, uh, try and promote other people's, uh, products because I, I fear being overly persuasive and, uh, and that can be a, that can be a dangerous thing. And I don't want to, uh, in any way impeach anybody else's credibility and their authority. I'm a huge fan. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan, and there's so much insight there. And uh, part of that was uh, was what you've been discussing on uh, on movements lately within the energy market. So uh, there's very few places where I feel I can get kind of really quality insights that are really oriented towards a sophisticated investor. Oh, uh, and I definitely am. I'm I'm not a New York Times reader. I used to be. I'm not anymore. I think their basis. I think their basis changed. Where they used to have really good financial and, uh, and sort of the Wall Street Journal. I think now it's become much more kind of a special interest. I think it's kind of. I I, I was complaining about the Wall Street Journal the other day too. I think it's become, especially when they cover things in the in the energy industry. It's all become very. I don't know, clickbaity to me. No offense. I have a lot of friends that write for the Wall Street Journal. I love their pieces. But I just think in general, I don't know. I think it's the media, probably the media in general, right? We're just. I, I think it is. I mean, I haven't read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal in quite some time about other type of investments because they were all very, they were all giving the people who were short on Tesla too much press. Right. And they were just part of kind of the, uh, they were cohorts with the shorts. I've been through this before. I've been in politics and finance for so long. That I'm used to them kind of being, uh, being uh, kind of uh, over overly eager to take a, a side, um, and uh, I'm frequently not on that side because I'm usually on the winning side of a trade rather than, you know. Um, right. So, uh, but I don't read them at all for energy anymore. You're right. Now that I think about it, because I still used to read them for energy up until about two years ago. And uh, there's just been no exposure into the into the developing countries whatsoever. Right. It's done. Done. It's it is. So uh, <laughs> what was that? I said so I'll cover that since nobody yeah. else. Yeah, so can you go actually uh, I'm gonna pry a little bit further. Can you go a little bit further into some indication of the reports that you've had in uh and um what you're doing with them? Would that be all right? So uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, again, it's all geopolitics. What I'm seeing in diff different countries, um, uh, you know, what happens, you know, it's a kind of a recap of what happened in the week, where where I see opportunity, not only in the United States, obviously, um, but you know, but but other countries. A lot of the stuff that I talked about today, um, I've already written about, but um, uh, um, but I mean, that's kind of you know. Well, in terms of histor historical, right? You know, when you, you look at these sites and you want to know kind of the archives of it, right? In terms of like biodiesel and uh, some of the suggestions that you had 
on uh, kind of stock picks and what you're looking at? Right. And those are gen generally, those are separate, or separate reports, right? So they'll come out throughout the week. If I find um, something that, you know, that catches my eye or that, you know, I've been researching, um, then I, you know, there's research reports during the week too on, you know, uh, what I'm looking at um, and, you know, uh, a trade idea about it or a, a trade recommendation about it companies that I see um, in that, that category. So, I mean, generally there's something out every week. Every week I do a uh, supplemental on the, um, on the oil reports, right? Because a lot of people were asking me, how do you even read this report? So I go in depth um, and break those down every week. Um, and and yeah, so part of my, uh, and I discussed this in the first part, and then we're gonna go to the last thing and then we're gonna go, right? Is that uh, I remember when we first used, used to speak and I would say, well, what exactly does this mean when a refinery would go offline or a boat would kind of disappear in the Mediterranean or whatever it is? Because there's always kind of this assumption and uh, it's certainly not a well-grounded one. I don't know why it's done, but that the reader on the other side is going to already know what these things mean and the implications of what they mean. Right. And there's really not an opportunity to do a lot of in inquiry. Right. So, I mean, I, that's what I, you know, and I, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, I get a lot of feedback, you know, I'm, I, I, I talk to, you know, my clients as well. So, you know, things that they, they want to see, I'm, you know, go ahead and, and research those things as well. Um, so I give, there's a lot of information during the week that's, that's given out. Yeah, you're awesome. I'm such a big fan. So I, I do appreciate that. And I told you, I'm always cautious about, uh, promoting because I don't want to uh, cross that line, right? Uh, but I am a fan, so I did want to say that. So thank we're going to close actually with uh, Pat Patrice's comment. So thank you so much. And uh, while we were speaking, I had to Google it. So now I know what it means. And I'm not going to tell anybody else what it means. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let everybody have that exercise and enjoy that, <laughs> except for people. And don't say it, Tracy. Do you know what that means? So, um, no, I can guess, but I don't know. No. Don't guess. Okay. So I want to, I want to thank everybody so much for their time. This has been a lot of fun and uh, thank you uh, for allowing Tracy and I to be the guest on uh, your Twitter feed and your YouTube destination. Right? I'm like a vacation package. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me, Adam. I'm very appreciative. Thank you guys. Everybody that's listening. I'm most appreciative. Um, I, I hope uh, I answered some questions and, we all learned some stuff today. You answered a lot. You were uh, grilled, right? You were, <laughs> you were definitely grilled, and you're awesome. You you were interrogated. You had the bright light on you. I know. There was a lot of questions. I don't think I, I, but I don't think I've done for. I don't think I've done a, a podcast in this long before. Or, uh, you know, it's fun. It's not a podcast. This is a lunch. Right? So, not, I haven't had this long. I haven't had a long lunch in a long time. Oh, <laughs> I have. I have long lunches. I make it a habit to uh, to slot two hours for lunch and to slot about three hours for dinner. I think it's important. I think it's important. I've always thought it was important to uh, distinguish lunches from a business meeting, unless it is a business meeting, uh, to uh, preserve kind of the social element of, of human in, uh, behavior and interactions. I want to thank everybody. You are awesome, Tracy. Everybody's awesome. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to press the button. We're going to, everyone's going to go. Everyone's going to go. I'm going to go. Tracy's going to go. Everyone else is going to go. We're all going to break apart, right? And uh, But Tracy is going to stay with me. So, Tracy, I press the button, but don't press any buttons. You're going to stay with me for next time. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody again. So thank you for uh, allowing us to be the guest on your feed. And I'm going to press the button now.